So I've been doing the risk assessments for years and years and years and years, been all over the world doing them all over the different states. And of course, it's changed dramatically And the risk assessment has become more and more important. Even for hospitals, it's more important now than it ever was. Uh, I gave a friend of mine, took my dachshund because I'm going out of town and she had all these questions about the, what to do with the dachshund. So I'm going out to do risk assessments in Virginia Beach, which is going to be nice. So I've been all around the world doing these. And now that I see that they're more important than they ever were, I think, for a whole bunch of things. And number one is active shooter. So people are worried about active shooter. It's a number one issue that keeps management awake at night. That's what Gardner says. That's what everybody says. And every time they do a survey, I notice that anytime I, I do a webinar and I put something boring in it, like compliance and liability, nobody shows up. But if it has the words active shooter in it, everybody shows up. I think we're changing. And I was very disheartened to find out that the active shooters have gone up again every year, actually, almost every year since Columbine. And it went up again during the pandemic. It went up again uh, 2021. And I'll show you those stats in a minute, but it's everything now. And of course, you heard about Dallas overnight, heard that horrible call that they broadcast about the girls stuck in the in the in the raging river that used to not be there and she's i don't know what to do she says you know i don't, I don't know what to do in the tornadoes and the hurricanes we haven't had any hurricanes which is great the terrorism domestic terrorism instead of al-qaeda extreme heat which we've never had before now we have and it's active shooter that's the worst and of course in the hospital industry it's workplace violence so uh, when we do threat profiles, we used to just do a narrow thing, like the eight things that the FBI has checked for, homicide, murder, rape, larceny, blackmail, extortion, and two other things. But now you have to cover all these different things when you do your threat profile. And it's now required that you do the risk assessment first, and you take the results of the risk assessment and apply them to the, the your solutions. So everything you're going to do for the next year. So... One of the things that we use to look at, at crime, the crime part of it, and look at your threat. This is a uniform crime index from the FBI. And I thought I'd look at a couple of ones that you probably know. So I live in Parkland. So this is Parkland. And Parkland is 77 out of 100. And that means only 23% of the U.S. is safer than Parkland. Then Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a five, five out of 100 means 95% of the United States cities are safer than Washington, D.C. And then uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and I have not got this right, so we're going to go to the next one. Uh, Beverly Hills, California is at a seven. You would think Beverly Hills, California would be up like 80 or something. It's seven. 93% of the U.S. cities are safer than Beverly Hills. Uh, Boise, Idaho, just going from one to another is a 30. So that means 70% of the U.S. is safer than Boise, Idaho. But if you rank them, you can see Parkland's the safest, Boise, Idaho's the next safest, uh, in Beverly Hills in Washington, D.C. They were going to, we can calculate that one later. So in June, we've had a very exciting, uh, in my industry, June, July, and August for, uh, for all sorts of horrible things including the domestic terrorism. And this is a domestic terrorism bulletin that came out. And so what I recommend is that you go ahead and when you get back to your offices, <coughs> is you send this out to everybody and just say, you know, this came out in the, the first of the summer by domestic terrorism, and they've continued to, to keep this advisory active. So I would just send that out to people or just to your management if you want just to, sh to see what we're dealing with over and over again. And you can see it in, in every, single, every single thing that you look at. So the other thing that I think has happened lately in this is that we have this huge amount of liability, liability issues that turn into judgment. So this morning I found out that the families in Uvalde, the sh school shooting in Texas, they just got, uh, the families got together and put in, I think it's like a $6 billion loss or $5 billion lawsuit against the district and the county and the sheriff's department for their handling of that situation. This is uh, the, the couple of recent ones. This is a spectrum one. And so this was also in Texas. And this was where uh, an installer, a spectrum 
cable installer. He went to this lady's house and she had money and credit cards sitting around. She was 83 years old, Betty Thomas. So he came back the next day, even though he didn't have to, to quote, adjust her system. And he took all her cards, took all her money, stabbed her to death in the home, in her home. And so the family took him to court and they found Charter Communications, that's a parent company of Spectrum, grossly negligent in the death. And it surprised me that the $7 billion is a lot of money, but they didn't do it based on the fact that he killed her. It wasn't like an off the street murder. He said there were systemic failures throughout the whole company, Charter Communications and all their uh, affiliates. He lied about, the guy lied about his work history. He said he didn't have any uh, felonies, but he did. They, but Spectrum never, never verified his employment records and they missed all the red flags that were ignored by his supervisors. Based on that, they sued Spectrum. They sued Charter Communications for not doing a background check, even though they said they did and that that was their policy. They sent a basically uh, a murderous felon into this old lady's house and Spectrum even charged the family $58 for the service call where she was murdered. And they sent the unbil unpaid bill to collection agency because the owner was dead. And they uh, first initially the jury awarded the family $375 million in compensatory damages and said Charter had to pay 90%. Then the next week, the judge came back, they found more information and the judge came back and said they have to pay a, an additional $7 billion to their family. Said the jury in this case was thoughtful and attentive to the evidence. The verdict uh, justly reflects the extensive evidence regarding the nature of harm caused by Spectrum, Charter Spectrum's gross negligent and reckless contact. So that we hope that the, uh, the board is listening. This is the next one. This happened July 13th. So, so about a month ago, and this was a nurse and a paramedic stabbed with serious injuries at SSM Health DePaul Hospital. And they said that the nurses came forward and they said that they had gone in many times to management and they totally ignored their pleas to increase security. They requested more security staff. They wanted to add concealed weapon metal detectors to prevent workplace violence incident. And again, it was a 30 year old woman who, who went in the ER, sat down, opened her purse, took out a, a knife and started to stab people. And the nurses said they weren't surprised that they'd, they'd been asking for this for years and it was 100% preventable. One of the nurses who no longer works there said, when you're working at DePaul, you're literally walking down the hall, looking over your shoulder. It just by happenstance, it turned out another hospital I work with in New York, they have an employee who left DePaul and went to New York because they didn't have any security. So, uh, that's the the deal like don't if you know there's a problem don't wait and do it later they requested it they never got it and then what happened next what happened next is they went on the news and they said that they have been doing an extensive survey for a long time about security at this bridge bridgeton missouri hospital that they've increased security and uh and they were already working on it before the stabbing happened and they said that they have a security guard now to be in the emergency department, 724, that they didn't have before. They added a metal detector. It's a six hospital in the St. Louis area to add a metal detector to the emergency hospital. And they said that they've been working on this for several months, but nobody knew about it until the stabbing happened. So it's too bad if that's what it takes to get something taken care of. So this is the active shooter incidents in the United States. This is an FBI report that came out in May of this year, and it summarizes the, the time from uh, 2020 to 2021. And I'm going to send you a copy of, this, of the presentation, the, the video. I'm also going to send you a copy of this FBI report. So here we have the difference between the two years. We have in uh, 2020, we had 40 incidents in 19 states in 2021. We had 61 incidents in 30 states. So you can see the growth is almost a third higher in one year. Uh, casualties, we had 164 casualties with 38 killed in 2020. And in 2021, we, we, we had 243 casualties and over, and over 100 killed. So three times the amount of people killed. So a huge increase in statistically in the in the number of casualties. Only one law enforcement officer was killed in 2020, two in 2021. Only 11 were wounded in 2025 and 2021. And this just goes with the story that, which is the truth, is that most of the time, no matter how hard they try to get there on time, usually the events 
completely over by the time law enforcement gets there, which is why we want you to have better controls in place so you don't have to wait for police to show up to be saved. You don't have to have 20 people killed or 34 people killed and injured like in Parkland, which is right across the street from me. And so five of these events in 2020 met the, the mass killing definition which means that, that three or more people, not including the shooter, were killed. Uh, 12 in 2021 incidents where law enforcement actually engaged the shooter. There were only, out of all these, there were only eight in 2020 and only 17 in 2021. And again, the gender, they were mostly male. Uh, again, there's not a lot of body armor. One person wore body armor in 2020, two in 2021. And who committed suicide? Well, Turns out seven committed suicide in 2020 of the shooters, 11 in 2021. And what's interesting, when you look at this another way by age, everybody who's under 60 did not commit suicide. The shooters that were over 60 are the ones who make up these numbers of the shooters who committed suicide. So that's just something to think to think about. So again, you know, why is this, why is this not getting better year after year after year? So this is what's been driving me crazy is that we know about this, we've known it for 20 years now, and every single year it gets worse. And so why is that happening? Why can't we, this is the one thing, most things that happen in society, you can get a hold of and put some laws in place and it'll help. In this case, it just gets worse. So one was coming out of the recession, you know, there were some uh, revenue problems that needed, that prevented hosp or hospitals used it as an excuse companies used it as an excuse to not put in the controls. There's that it, it can't happen here mentality. And I saw that, you know, it's not just in, uh, it's not just in hospitals. It was in URLV in the school shooting. And I'll never forget that because, uh, you know, what, what happened there was here they come right after the thing's over that, oh, it can't happen here. We're such a tight knit community. Everybody knows everything. And all of a sudden the kid, you know, shoots his grandmother in the face, shoots her face off, steals her truck, yells out the window to the neighbors who are standing in their yard. I'm going to the school to kill some people. And nobody called the, nobody called the police. Nobody called the school. Nobody sent a text to anybody. They just let it happen. And so I guess that's people, have, maybe they have uh, active shooter fatigue. They're so tired of worrying about it. Maybe they thought he was kidding. You know, who knows? But older administrators, especially too, have this idea it can't happen here. We're a place of refuge. People come here for help. I've had so many people tell me we don't want to put up any screening because it looks bad. It looks bad to come in the lobby and see a line. Thank God you don't have to have a line anymore, but you can still get the screening. And so I'm going to be mentioning that later. It's the only thing that's going to stop these shootings from happening. And I also find that many of the administration and president CEOs of companies, COOs, they have no idea that the fines are so big. And I'm talking about the OSHA fines. I'm talking about Justice Department fines. I'm talking about the lawsuits and the potential liability. Like you see, it's just, in fact, when I sent that thing out about the charter spectrum, $7 billion, one of my friends called me on the phone and said, are you sure you didn't mean $7 million? Is that a typo? No, it's not a typo. It's $7 billion. So, uh, and also that a lot of these things are required. They're not just a choice anymore. Like it's nice to have a camera. It's nice to have this, they're required. And as a lot of the workplace violence things, as you'll see, are required now too, because of this change. So again, workplace violence and healthcare and everything related to it in companies isn't slowing down. It's a known problem. It recurs more frequently today than it ever did. And you can say that almost every month. So how are we going to slow these rates down and protect our patients and clients and school kids and everything? You know, I have kids in school. So how common is it? OSHA said it's more dangerous than working on a high-rise building to work in anything related to healthcare. And the doctors say that the violence in the emergency department's increasing and it's affecting patient care. So why is this still happening? So I was trying to, if you have another idea, please speak up or send it to me. You have to use the Q&A because the chat for some reason isn't working on Zoom today, but you know, the security is like an afterthought to everybody. It's not, you know, they do all this stuff of talking about their profits and their revenue targets and, you know, who they're going to merge with and all this stuff, but they really, you never hear that about security. Security sort of in the background. 
it's also an expense item. It's not a revenue generation source. It's going to cost money. So people don't want to talk about that. and They don't want to have it in their budget. It also still uh, follows what I consider an outdated law enforcement model. So the law enforcement model is somebody does something bad and you go find them and you grab them and you put them in prison. You turn them to, over to the justice system basically for trial. None of that happens in security. In security, it's this game of guessing what's going to happen next. When you have, you know, 30, I remember when they had the shooting in uh, John Hopkins in downtown Baltimore, I was driving back from doing a security conference. And they said that they had somebody interviewing the head of security for John Hopkins. And they just had the first sort of scary active shooter thing where the guy uh, killed his mother and he, he shot the doctor in the stomach and then he killed himself in the mother's room because the doctor had made a mistake in the operation and she was going to be paralyzed. And I remember them asking, how many entrances do you have at the hospital? And they said 12. And they said, well, don't you think that's a lot of entrances to have to have someone there and police them? And the guy said, oh, no, we don't have anybody there. You know, people just come and go as they want. But there's your part of your problem. And I'm sure you've heard about, we're going to talk a lot about the, the door propping. So again, the tech, tech, everybody talks about you know, artificial intelligence, AI, you know, and they, oh, we, you know, are you in a technology company? Are you uh, a, a physical company, you know, like a construction company? And it's really not like that. I mean, tech is embedded in physical security. It's embedded in all these facility products that are coming out now. It's embedded in panic alarms. Everything has a tech component to it. Now, I don't think people appreciate that. And so they continue to think of these things, no matter how hard they try, to think about physical and facility security the same way you do IT security and consider them at the same time because they're interrelated. And I can't count the number of places where I go and I, I say, okay, well, where's the screen that shows you know, where all the cameras are looking? Oh, this, it's locked in our IT closet. And if the IT guy's out to lunch, I can't even see if it's there because it's locked. And he's the only person who has a key, obviously, in the IT closet. So I'm just going to run through a couple of these examples for you so you can see how bad it's gotten this summer. This is the Geneva Presbyterian Church in Southern California on May 15th. And of course, they have no access to church, no access control, no weapon screening. And we do have started working a lot with churches. But uh, in this one, the shooter was Chinese. He hated Taiwanese people, and Geneva Presbyterian was a church of Taiwanese Americans. So what he did was he drove three hours to get there. He took, uh, he took super glue. He glued the church door shut. He brought a nail gun, and then he nailed the church door shut on top of the glue, and then he put a big chain around him with a deadbolt on it. So he chained the church door shut. Then he went back into the back of the church through an open door, and he shot and 10 senior citizens aged 75 to 90. And uh, there was a doctor there who his mother had called him, couldn't drive and ask him to take her to church. So he did. He hit the shooter with a chair and stopped him. But then the shooter got his gun and, and killed the doctor. And so that was what happened in the Geneva Presbyterian Church. There's so much violence in a church. Then we have, of course, the Uvalde school shooting. There were, when, when, the, when it was all over, there were 300 and 346 law enforcement professionals 12 inches away outside the door to the classrooms. The kids bled out in the classrooms. They were afraid to open the doors and go in. And the commander on site was afraid of getting any of his officers hurt. So instead, they sat there and listened to the kids, listened to the gunshots. And the kids were actually using their cell phones to call 911 say, please send the, we've been shot, please send a, a dispatch. We have 10 kids in here who are shot, my best friend shot, you know, and they didn't do anything. So uh, that's a 77 page report that I'll be happy to send to you if you're interested in it too, I have it. The last seven pages are all the solutions and they really, really need some help. So this is uh, a medical building, like with doctor's offices inside of in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the Natalie building off of the St. Francis Medical System, which is a big hospital there. And so this is a medical lobby that's adjacent to that. And so this guy, Michael Lewis, he uh, got a back operation. And when his doctor told him he wasn't going to prescribe the pain medicine he wanted for him, he went back. 
that right after it was released from hot well what they was released from the hospital on may 24th he went to a gun store and got an assault rifle of course he didn't have to sign anything or have a background check he took it to the hospital with him along with a 40 caliber smith and wesson semi-automatic handgun he'd bought on may 29th so one of the loopholes in the law that i think needs to be changed i don't mind standing up and saying this that it, you have to be registered to get a handgun but you can buy an assault rifle without being registered and having a background check so what he did uh mr lewis after after he got his guns he went back right back to the hospital the next day and he targeted uh, dr preston phillip the surgeon had operated on his back and he went out, went up, walked right into the building. There was no security there. There was no screening there. There was nothing. There was a receptionist who asked him what he was doing there and he shot and killed her. And there was a bystander he also shot and killed. So he killed four people. He went up to the second floor and uh, killed a doctor who had operated on him. This is what the Natalie Medical Building looked like that day. You see all the officers are all outside, everything shooting going on in between. This is Encino Hospital Medical Center. This is in part of, part of Los Angeles County. And this was a doctor and two nurses stabbed at the hospital. This was sort of bizarre. That's why this summer is so weird. So the doctor parks his car. Let's see. Let me start over. Okay. So this guy pulls up in his car outside of this building. He leaves his car in the street. He just turns it off and runs in the into the hospital. He has his dog with him on a leash, takes a dog with him. And then uh, he's also uh, down here, an ultrasound technician who saw him said that he saw the guy with the dog. He thought he was high on drugs. He was very anxious. He was drenched in sweat. And the guy went into the emergency room. He saw a doctor and two nurses and he stabbed them. And then he locked himself into the emergency department and they sent the SWAT team and they tried to talk to him for four hours with, with no success. And finally, uh, they went in and, and they, uh, they killed him. And the three people were at, they sent them to another hospital. So the guy was just like having a meltdown. I don't know if it was drugs or something else, but took his dog in them to, with the, to the emergency room. So when you look back and you see, so I, all the time I'm talking, and I've talked to everybody on this call about this before, what, is, what do you, does it take to stop an act? Does, will panic alarms help? No, we, we've seen panic alarms on it. I've even seen a lady who said she had three panic alarms at the reception desk but none of them work because it never replaced the batteries in any of them. Panic alarms that are given out, people don't know how to use. People who leave the panic alarm on their desk and walk down two feet and everybody should have panic alarm. If you, it doesn't matter if you have a car dealership or you have a manufacturing plant or anything, or even a church, you should have a panic alarm or more than one person should have a panic alarm because when you see somebody come in with a gun, you need to press it and you can set it so it's going to contact all these different people at the same time. But if you don't have them, you're just there by yourself. Live receptionist, that doesn't work. They killed the, re the receptionist at the Washington Navy Yard shooting, which I was there for. And also live receptionist at this building. Nope, They're not alive after they kill them. Security officer present. Nope, policies and procedures. And that's a conditional no. They have policies and procedures, but just like in Uvalde, the policy was to immediately go in and get the shooter, take out the shooter. They didn't do that. So what, is it a policy if nobody follows it? That's, you know, it's like well, the sound of one hand clapping. If you, if you put in all these policies because they're required and then you don't follow them and people die because of it, that's not a, not a policy and procedure to me. Would a, a faster police response help? Probably not because the guy, once he shot the receptionist, he was upstairs. He could have barricaded the elevator, do whatever. Probably the shooting was already over by the time the police got there. And so the only thing that I figured out that's going to help is to do this concealed weapon screening to enter the building, to get past the lobby. And so a uh, thing about concealed weapon screening or weapons detection screening, proper name, is that it's completely advanced since we heard about it last or since we went to the airport. So I'm going to the airport next week on Sunday night and I know what's going to happen. You know, even on Sunday night, I'm going to wait for a long time. I'm not going to have to take off my shoes because I'll wear sandals. But, you know, they'll take everything out. They'll put it in a bin. You know, they'll do all the stuff. And then the part that I noticed is a lady who's looking through the x-ray because all the stuff's in a bin going through the x-ray scanner. But she's manually looking for it with her own eyes to see if she can see something. And if she can't quite see something and it looks dangerous, you know, like my curling iron, 
then they'll go open my suitcase and go through it, you know. So uh, concealed screening they're doing now is number one, it's inexpensive. Number two, it actually finds things because it doesn't, you don't have to take anything out of your pocket. You don't have to take off your shoes. You don't have to take off your belt buckle. You can leave your cell phone in your pocket because what it's doing, it's, it's alarming on different kinds of metal composition, more than just iron that is in all guns that other things too that are knives and things going to alarm anytime it finds out and then isolate you so you have to wait for somebody to let you go it can also lock down the whole building in one second and so it's completely different than what you see at the airport and it it will actually stop concealed weapons from coming into the building and i know that because uh the ex the former ceo of cleveland clinic tried out in three uh, northern Ohio hospitals, and they found 30,000 weapons, identified 30,000 weapons that had been coming through in the past, but now they were stopped. And so once you put a concealed weapons detection system in, it stops it. And one, one place that they installed it, tell me about it, in two hours, they had two guns. I mean, people were bringing weapons in all the time, but they didn't know it and have any way to check it. So this is just another thing. This is a potluck dinner at a church in Alabama, Episcopal Church. Potluck dinner, the guy, gunman, opens fire after they eat. He eats first with these people, and then he opens fire and kills them. Kills two and actually three. The third one has died now. But a uh, lone suspect in their small church group meeting and began shooting. Three people were shot. Now three people are de deceased. They didn't know why he was there. Nobody knew him. He'd never been there before. And it turns out he, he had a gun store that he had to move to his house because he went out of business. And he was angry about that. So he went to the church and shot people. If you think about these elements, the compliance and liability are really a big part of security and safety. Because if people could get away with doing these things all the time and not kill people, they would because they don't want to be they don't want to be out of compliance because that turns off the money from the federal government, state government. They don't want liability because they don't want these huge lawsuits that we're getting now. And so the CMS final rule on emergency preparedness, it covers 17 kinds of, of medical things like hospitals and things like that. So uh, that's, uh, that's as part of that. Also, the general OSHA general duty clause has been beefed up. In the past, it all required, it's still today, required employers to maintain a safe environment free of, and I'm just going to add this in here because everybody asked me about it, recognized threats. This is what's happened lately. The Senate bill finally passed. The House passed the workplace violence bill in uh, April of 2021. So now it, Tammy Baldwin introduced the workplace violence prevention for healthcare and social service work, and that got passed finally with 26 vote margin. So that's in, in progress and it's gonna be voted on really, really soon too. So I'm just gonna go back to where I, it's, it was the old OSHA 3148, which I've used in a whole bunch of assessment. And it's, they took, they even said in the new bill, they said that they're gonna use this as a guidelines because it covers every kind of workplace violence, active shooter, everything that got the Senate bill passed. And so now we want to think, okay, how can we prevent these active shooters and workplace violence for healthcare and everybody else? And so again, if I look, you know, you guys are all experienced on this call. So if you want to speak up, please do. But to me, access control is the most important thing. If they have access into an area and they can get in there, no matter how they do it, that's the worst case. And once they're in there, they can shoot, well, they can hide their guns. The enforced entry concealed weapons screening is the best, I think. And again, you can spend money on policies and procedures and have them completely ignored at the time of the shooting. You can train people. But if somebody there has a gun, you know, at the time of the shooting, it's the training is not really going to help you. They talk about how it helps, but it really doesn't. You know, you think about the Pulse nightclub shooting 
Think about the Uvalde shooting. Think about Sandy Hook. Think about kids getting pushed in Parkland too, kids pushed in closets. And it really doesn't, just because you know where to hide doesn't help you. The shooter's there. He's got the gun. He knows how to he knows how to find you. He found those kids in the closet in Sandy Hook and just bam, 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 killed all of them. Six-year-olds. How can you kill a six-year-old? I couldn't kill a six-year-old frog, you know? I certainly couldn't kill a six-year-old human. So again, you know, the, the third thing, you need the most current policies and procedures, and they have to be have to be complied with. So that I think one of the things is because the people who are going in are the often security officers, law enforcement types, things like that, police, sheriff, and nobody, everybody loves them and everybody wants them to be okay. So they don't want to punish them going in or not going in. They, you know, don't want to fire your police force for not going in, but that's what's going to have to happen if you want to have these shootings stop. The other thing is you got to secure the doors. And the windows, not so much, but the doors for sure. And so many of these things are linked to propped open doors. And the ones they investigate, almost everyone has going in a back door that was that was propped open. And I just finished a lighting survey in downtown Los Angeles at a big facility down there. Next morning, I went back. I was there for a week. And I said, can I, is the cafeteria open? Can I, where is it? Can I go get some coffee? And they said, oh no, it's closed for a week. Well, why is it closed for a week? Rat infestation, right? So many doors propped open, uh, workers showing up early in the morning to prepare all the food for the day. And the rats are there. The rats see that open door in the middle of three o'clock in the morning and they go breakfast, you know? And so they had a rat infestation so bad that they had to actually close for a whole week. So the other thing that I think is like critically important is you have to keep checking on where you are in this stuff. So you have to do these risk assessments like they really mattered, not like you're going to take them and put them on the shelf, which is what happened in the past. But the requirements for the assess risk assessments, not only for facilities, but in HIPAA and everything, that's their whole thing this year is they're going to emphasize the risk assessment, the risk analysis work. Because unless you go in and check to make sure these things are in place like the doors, you're not going to have this, you're going to have continually to have this problem. That's back to the access control, back into the screening. Even if you're coming in, if you're the worker, you park in the parking lot, you don't want to walk around to the lobby and go through the screening. And so somebody gets killed. You have to walk around the lobby and go through the screening. The extra, you know, 10 feet of space that you're going to walk is not going to kill you. So that's what we got to we got to focus on and do. So this is, a, again, the general duty clause that we talked about. This is more Uvalde. This is a report that came out that I talked about that you can get online. And I'm going to, you'll be able to see the link right here. You can also just put in your browser. It's a hot, still a hot news story. So if you put Texas House of Representatives Uvalde shooting report, you'll find it. You don't even need the link. This is a guy holding the report up. That's his daughter who was killed. And so we can go back and go through these controls. So this was a list of controls that I had for active shooters. So what, what did I have? This was a year ago. Access control for all doors. Absolutely. Area of refuge. You know, this is something that the CMS requires, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid of healthcare centers. But again, if you're checking the people who are coming in and make sure they don't have concealed weapons, you don't need an area. Of refuge, posts and barriers at the front entry. I still, this is again an access issue, and I still highly recommend that. You'll see why in a minute. Camera. So I went to a, a manufacturing facility that was so old that every time they got their cameras like 30 years ago, and the wiring was so bad that they can't add any more cameras to it. So they started out with, I think, 35 cameras, and it went down to 24, then it went down to 15, and now it's down to 12. And the, the hospital doesn't want to pay to, to redo all the wiring, so they can't get any new cameras because they won't work these with the old wiring. So uh, concealed weapons detection screening is fantastic. And I'm going to give you a site where you can get a demo if you want. You can get an online demo. They can walk you through it. They will come to your facility and do a setup if you want. Because again, it's not, it's not a lot of equipment. It's just two posts standing up and a little uh, fixture for the computer to go. And then our disaster recovery plans. You know, they still need these for all the, the natural disasters, the extreme heat, the climate change, the flooding and everything. But again, maybe not so much to avoid an active shooter. This isn't going to really prevent an active shooter. The mass emergency notification systems, everybody has these now. 
updating the emergency plan. So again, this is the influence of climate on all these that you may not think about so much, but every time it happens with a big heat wave, the emergency rooms fill up, they can't handle them. And there's also areas, especially in major cities where they also have heat waves, where the old, old people are, are basically stacked in apartments and things, and they can't get out, they can't get to the emergency room. And those are the ones that they find dead after these extreme heat waves. If you have, so say Dallas, so Dallas has probably never had a flood like the one that they had over the weekend where they had, uh, I think, 24 inches of rain in less than eight hours. And so, again, what do you have to do? You have to take that information when you do a risk assessment. You have to identify that as a new threat, as a bad, really bad threat. And then you, you can deal with it in the your plan, go, your going forward plan, your new emergency policies and procedures. They're all going to change because of this. Your incident reporting is going to change. And so these this is how you deal with this. You start ranking these things in order of importance and again this is just you have all these shooting it can't happen here we've never updated our policies and procedures we didn't check into the guy ramos after he was uh ruled a menace and do all this stuff the commander on the scene didn't get notified that the 911 calls were still coming in oh and just like in parkland they didn't allow first responders in because they were afraid somebody was going to get hurt so they let the kids bleed out on the floor Again, uh, no accountability. And so to me, if people are going to prop their door open and somebody's going to get in and shoot people, that because that's the last bastion of protection, right? Even if you don't have an access control system, if you can just walk in the door, it's something's going to happen. And so I think there have to be consequences for these things, including prop, propping open doors. Just because you're working in the kitchen in a facility doesn't mean you have the right to endanger everybody by leaving the door propped open so you can get the nice breeze off the water. It's just not, it's not, you have to, you have to have punishment that fits the crimes and these, and they should be crimes, I think. And so this is what they said, there was error at every level. You know, they, this is one of the local reps who's in, in investigating this. Even the legislative level, they said plenty of blame to go around. This is another one that happened in Minnesota. Again, the constant assessing patients to see where the threats are. Uh, this was a guy who who went to a hospital, same deal, have a lot of these related to pain medication, not getting enough pain medication. And they, this guy actually went to the Motel 6, rented a room, built a bomb in his room, took a city bus across town to go to this facility and uh, went in and shot five, five people, set off bombs in the lobby, again, killed the receptionist. And so the nurses union sent out a release that day, just incidentally saying that 95% of the nurses say that they're not safe from violence at work. And again, the pain meds, people, doctors being tra tracked and hunted in hospitals, roaming a hospital, searching for the doctor after he was told he would be weaned off painkillers because he had a, he had an overdose and it was reported. And if you're using painkillers and you overdose on them, you can't have them again. So Again, it just goes first thing of pain medicine. So I want to talk to you about the concealed weapon system because I think it's a way to at least start getting these casualty numbers down instead of going up every single year. Very affordable screening system to keep concealed weapons out. And 50% of facilities, hospitals, 50% of hospitals, and probably 80% of other kinds of organizations do no screening at all. And so you need to show management what the return on investment is by screening the weapons so you don't have these big shootings and you don't have a $7 billion lawsuit. It also cuts down on having a security officer stationed somewhere 24 hours sitting there. And I went to a big federal agency downtown. They had two screeners. Both of them were turned off. But they had security officers sitting there anyway in these two areas, and they weren't even using them. It was the first thing I, I wrote up in my uh, risk assessment, of course. Again, what we're looking for is how to protect our high-value critical assets. We're analyzing them by return on investment, looking at them, looking at the uh, assess, doing these assessments every single week in a process. So you complete your all hazards assessment, you, you start impl in implementing the changes that were recommended. Same thing with OSHA and every organization that hires one employee has to have OSHA worksite assessments every year. 
must use the most current threat data cannot be a spreadsheet, it says, or, or a checklist. And so those of you on the call who are familiar with this, we want to analyze and update the threat data. We want to identify all the criticality. We want to survey the staff to see if they're aware of the things that they're supposed to be doing, like going in if there's a shooter, uh, analyze and rate the implementation of all these controls and prepare action reports for the board to vote on for the next meeting. And that's part of the deal is they want to see that the board took responsibility for this. No matter what kind of an organization you are, you have a board and they have to sign off on it. So you have to explain it, make it easy enough to explain to a board member to understand. We have to get these controls in place. Again, updating the emergency plan based on the results of the assessment, especially with all this climate change stuff going on. Uh, real, re realizing that lack of security is not a legal argument. And this is just a couple of samples of a couple of the lawsuits in the last couple of years. McDonald's sued in and for $27 million lost the lawsuit after two kids died in fighting in their parking lot after they'd been ordered a hundred times to get a security officer and get lighting installed in there. U.S. Security Associates sued for $64 million in the Kraft Cracker Factory lawsuit in Philadelphia. They lost. A lady uh, got fired. She went out to her car, got her Glock, came back in. The security people uh, locked themselves in a cast iron boiler room and she shot in all three three people who had let her go and two of them died one of them's paralyzed uh, stanford health up in northern california sued for 82 million dollars after a lady got out of her cardiac rehab in a stanford building stepped on the gas instead of the uh, brake went right through the double glass doors and ran over the director of lawrence livermore labs family won 82 million dollar settlement it's another hospital one where the nurses received $8 million after they were raped, drug around by their hair and upset it just because a guy ate his sandal to get out of prison. Again, these incidences, they look at, they affect your state funding. They create millions of dollars in liability and just doing the right thing is, is really worth it. So here we're analyzing, trying to think about what are the factors in place of loss, a potential loss we could have if somebody's uh, killed, lawsuit that their family's going to do, and $3 million, as you can see, is nothing compared to the kind of lawsuits that are coming down. You look at the annual cost, $1,000 to $1,500, annual cost $18,000, return on investments at least one in 2000 meaning for every dollar you spend, you, you prevent $2,000 in other related costs. And then you're creating a continual cycle of improvement. You get the report, you, 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 you look at what it said the new threats were, you identify what you're protecting, you survey the staff, you evaluate the state of all the controls and make sure that you have this link here that the controls are actually protecting against the threats that are real and the most important threats. Then next, then you, you write the next, next year, you write another report, again, go through the same thing over again because the threats will have changed, the competence of the staff would have changed. I went to some, a lot of places I do three and four years in a row, and one of them I did where it completely changed from one year. The year before, everybody knew all the answers. Turned out they had got a grant, and they hired a whole bunch of new people, and new people didn't know what the rules were, didn't, had never been trained. Then we evaluate all those controls, come up with our action plan, use all the threat data, and provide this for you how often the threat occurs, what the uniform crime index is. That's what we looked at at the beginning and all the different elements. So this Athena security, athena-security.com has this entryway system and they're a high tech company and they built the AI artificial intelligence into this. So it automatically integrates with RFID so it can identify any staff member that you have with a badge. It maintains a traffic flow of 3,000 to 4,000 people per hour. And it can go real fast if you don't have to take your shoes off or take anything in and out of your pockets. So it can open and lock, open doors, lock doors on a floor, can block turnstiles so it can trap somebody in a turnstile, has a man trap you can get. And then you can view your monitor, view what's happening right on your phone. So what they want is a safe and secure world and they, without a uh, feeling of entering a jail. And again, you get the fast flow because you don't have to take out your cell phone. You don't have to take out your keys, your watch, anything. You can go right through unless you have, like Cleveland Clinic, 
knives and guns that are coming in, mace they, is something else that they, they carry in bear spray. So again, what makes Athena and their products so different from these other metal scanning, weapon scanning detections? It's the only one that meets a federal standard from NIH, has the highest accuracy of mass casualty targets. And so they check this all the time. They're doing a lot of research on making sure that it has the lowest uh, false alarms, the highest throughput through the 3,600 people per hour walking through, the lowest nuisance alarm using their sensors. You can use it standalone or you can network it into the uh, systems you have. Has a silent mode available if you want to have a sign that says something instead of having a, an announcement. Of course, it's not harmful to humans. It's not the dated airport technology and it's affordable. So that's why I think that companies who are looking at what to do next, if you want to cut down the casualties and not have one of these active shooters happen to you, I think this is something you should seriously look at. Here's the uh, National Institute of Justice Standard 601.02. And this is a law enforcement correction standard and testing program. You can just put the name of this in it and it'll pull it right up on your screen. This is what it looks like when you walk through. You got your backpack, you got your headphones on, you got your cell phone in your hand, and you're just walking through these two posts that are 36 to 40 inches apart. And this is a computer that's measuring, reading everything off these the feeds it's got and analyzing everything so it can tell the difference between a cell phone and a, and a knife, for example, and detects more concealed weapons than any other screening system. So we want to look at the controls that you already have and see how much of them are implemented. If the staff are trained on them, are you introducing new controls to the staff properly? And if you're introducing weapons detection, again, you're going to help the staff because we have so many times this year where somebody's committed suicide because they, they and it's a staff member but they don't have to go through screening. So they bring their gun. We had one at the Benomatic plant, you know, where they make the coffee, coffee, the make coffee for in break rooms and things like that. We had an Amazon, we had a, a hospital, Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia, where the guy came in to, who worked there. They had no screening, of course. So he walked right to his job in the emergency department. Halfway through, he took his gun out that had brought specifically for that and killed himself in front of the doctors, the patients, everybody. So you really don't want that to happen where you are. And uh, so we can analyze for you the return on investment from this, the controls that you have to put in place. And that's how we get this return on investment by their cost benefit analysis by a dollar amount. So for every dollar that you spend on this, you save $2,500. Maybe you save $3,000. I don't know. It has to have to do this analysis every single time. But the bottom line is you want to guarantee compliance with these requirements and reduce liability and prevent these active shooter incidents before they happen. So if anybody here has ever seen Deja Vu with Denzel Washington playing the F AFT agent, ATF agent, and he says, just once, I always go places and I have to figure out, you know, what happened and how I could have prevented it just for once. I'd like to be able to do something about it before it happens. That's what we're trying to do here. Do not just go down the list and of the controls, whether you need them or not. Take your money and spend it on some screening. And then you can have the numbers to talk to management about what you need to secure your facility based on the threats that you know are there because they're in the, F the, F the FBI Uniform Crime Index. Again, lack of security, not considered a legal argument after an active shooter event. Start by analyzing your current access control system, add a concealed weapon screening system, and get, a, get the best bang for the buck. And if you have any more questions about this or would like to get a short demo or anything, just call me Caroline at riskandsecurityllc.com. And I am an independent consultant but I am tired of watching people get killed. So I found a company that's actually doing something about it. And I want to make sure everybody knows about that. And I hope I'll see you all in uh, the Carolinas if anybody's going to the IAHSS meeting. And if not, I'm sure I'll see you at ASIS. Or if you want to uh, meet me, just let me know. Send me an email. It's my email address. And if you want technical information from Michael Green, 
at Athena Security. He's a CEO. You can email him there. And again, I'm uh, hanging out here in Parkland, Florida, trying to make the world better. And if you have any questions, let me know. So thank you all for coming. It's nice to see you guys. Hopefully we'll be able to fix the chat problem with Zoom, but you can always email me and you can also, also chat at me if you want to, because you all have my phone number too. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <music>